Hello, welcome everybody to uh, this edition of Harbour Talk Time. Keith Hiscock, CEO of Harbour & Co. I'm pleased to be joined today by Steve Clapham to talk about his book recently published called The Smart Money Method, How to Pick Stocks Like a Hedge Fund Pro. See, before we get into some questions about the book, can you just outline your career and why you're in a position to write such a book? As you well know, Keith, because we've worked together on and off for the last, um, well, I daren't say how long it is. It's so long we feel and sound really, really old. But, um, you know, I started um, in the city working for a stockbroker. I spent 15 plus years on the sell side, working at various investment banks, covering various sectors, various geographies. And um, I was then asked by one of my clients to go and work for him at a hedge fund. And I spent the last 15 or so years, I worked at two hedge funds, both multi-billion dollars as a partner and as head of research. I set up my own business and I um, spent some time picking stocks and running some portfolios for a, a, a UK wealth manager. And then laterally, I went to work with uh, two guys trying to build up a, a, a small hedge fund, which wasn't very successful. And I therefore set up a training business in 2018. So apart from the time that I spend working with Hardman, I have a, a business behind the balance sheet, which trains both institutional investors in a forensic accounting course and private investors. We have an online school, the most popular product is a 12 month analyst academy. And um, all this time in stock markets, I've spent a huge amount of time thinking about how to be a more effective equity analyst. And that is what I've tried to put into the book. Thank you. Right. So what prompted you to write the book though? What was the, what was the catalyst for that? Well, it's like, it's like, I don't know who the person was that said everybody's got a book in them. Um, I just fancied writing a book, and obviously we've been in we've been in lockdown, which was a you know a reason to sit down and and look at doing something different. But um, I'd actually been squirreling away ideas about improving the research process for many many years. I I actually had kept a notebook and whenever I had a thought or an idea about an improvement in my methodology, I used to record it in this notebook. And often I would learn something from a competitor or from reading a book and all those thoughts got recorded in a notebook. And when I ended up filling the notebook up, it was quite a, it was quite a thick notebook. I, um, I then sort of transferred all the thoughts into, into the, a Word document, into a computer. And um, I then decided, well, you know, this isn't very structured. I, the reason for recording it in a notebook is I find I remember things more effectively if I write them down. And the act of writing it down makes me think about what I'm writing and makes me formulate my thoughts more precisely. And so I ended up, I had, uh, you know, the outline of a book. It wasn't in, the, in that structure but I um, developed into, into the structure of, of a book and um, then filled in the blanks, I think. So I've worked with hundreds of uh, investment analysts during my 40 years in the city. I've told you what the number is. Uh, I, I'd put you in the top three most clinical and forensic uh, analysts. And so it's slightly surprising that when you look at the book, there are not a huge number of tables and charts, which is great because it makes it really readable. But why did you write it that way? Uh, if I'm, to be honest about this, there were more tables and charts in the first draft. But uh, one, of the, one of the reasons some of the tables dropped out was I couldn't get people to give me permission to use their content. And you can't publish the book unless you've actually got written permission to use somebody's somebody's table. But the other thing was I deliberately thought that if it's full of tables, if it's full of numbers, if it's full of charts, it will put a lot of private investors off. And my ambition with this book was to try and help the lay person understand the stock market, 
to try and enable people to become investors. Because, you know, I now run an education business and I found that to be quite rewarding, not financially rewarding, but in rewarding in a, in a, in a sense that I feel that I'm enabling people, I'm, I'm empowering people. And the idea of the book was precisely that, was to empower more people to take control of their finances and ride the equity market and you know allow themselves to, to, to get involved. And you know, many people are frightened of it. And if you've got a book that when you open it up, you know, you go through and you go, oh man, look, it's just full of numbers, you know, you're alienating half your audience, half your potential sales. So I thought far better idea was not to do that, but to make it much more simple and approachable and readable. And I mean, funnily enough, we're, we're doing an audio book. The audio book hasn't hit Amazon yet, but the, you know, there's a lot of people that listen to books nowadays. And so the audio book will come out. It should, it was meant to come out last week with the, with the book itself, but it should be out in a couple of weeks of some internal thing at Amazon and, um, by far the best. So I had to audition the, the people for the audio book. And um, by far the best person was an English person who had a you know really good um, way of reading, but I felt that the Americans wouldn't understand them. So I've gone with this. I mean, some of them were. I mean, what they were doing, I, I, I've got no idea why they were auditioning. But I've gone with this guy who's very jolly. So it would be quite. Well, I have no idea what it would be like. But the the idea is the book can be an audiobook and you know a book with I, it didn't set I didn't deliberately set out with that basis but the, you know it, it, it is possible to do that and that is yes you know we're used to reading research reports and research reports are trying to um, reinforce an investment message and it's about the numbers and therefore you have lots of charts and tables and obviously when I write research reports today, they're full of charts and tables. But when you're trying to explain a process, when you're trying to explain a methodology, when you're trying to explain how something works, yes, a few charts are helpful, but you don't need a huge number. So uh, I think that. Uh, and so following on from that, so some investors just look at the accounts and they think that's good enough um, to uh, come to a conclusion. Um, you talk about lots of other flags in there, such as looking at looking out for changing directors, looking who the other shareholders are. For example, I love the story uh, about Ralph Lauren. Do you want to tell yeah. us that one? Well, I mean, the Ralph Lauren board. I mean, the 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 the, the board. I think we when we did that it was maybe eighteen months or two years ago. So the people are probably even older now. But the, the Ralph Lauren board is quite extraordinary because there are only three people on the board who are under the age of 60. One of them at the time was 58, now be over 60, I, I'm guessing, is a non-executive director, has been on the board for, I think, eight years. One of them is the chief executive, Patrice Louvet, who was the chief executive at the time. And the third person was Ralph's son, David. Now, the rest of the board are over 60 and in many cases over 70. And how many 70 year old people do you think go and shop in Ralph Lauren? I mean, you know, it's not a shop for 70 year olds. It's a shop for people who are much, much younger. And it just seemed to me ludicrous that Ralph, very successful though he is, has surrounded himself with people of his own age. That. Really inappropriate. Um, so, you know, when you, you know, I wouldn't invest in Ralph Lauren because I just think the board's got the wrong, got the wrong profile. Uh, you know, it, it may, it may, I may then miss lots of successful investments, but at least I'll, you know, I'll be with people where, where I think that they have got some clue what's going on in the business. You also talk about following other fund managers. Why is that? And who would you follow? Well, I mean, I think if you're if you're sitting as I was in a big hedge fund and you're trying to deploy 
very large amounts of capital into an individual stock idea, then you have to be in front of the pack. You know, you have to be one of the first people to recognize that because as soon as you start buying and building up a very large position, you will move the share price. So if a lot of people already bought it, the actual available stock to be consumed and churned in the market will be much more limited. But if you're a private investor, you're not gonna move the share price. So why would you not go where some other people have already gone fishing? And if highly successful investors with very good track records have owned this stock for a long time or a short time, have been buying the stock, I mean, there, there's various things I go through in the book about, you know, you don't, you don't want to buy it when the guy that you really respect has owned it for three years and is now selling it. You want to buy it, you know, when he's building up his position because he thinks it's a, a good idea today. And you can't um, delegate the, the task of picking your stocks to somebody else. But why would you want to go and buy something that nobody else wanted? You don't need to be that contrarian as a private investor. You may as well go where Terry Smith has already been. And if Terry Smith thinks it's a good idea, then you know that there's a, a decent probability that it will be a good idea. Or Nick Train, or Andreas Halverson at Viking, or Steve Mandel at Lone Pine, or Sir Chris Horn at TCI, or John um, um, Armitage at Ed Edgerton Capital. I mean, there's loads of really successful investors. Joe Greenblatt, I read, is a book by a Belgian um, author who studied the performance of different, of different people. And you know, Warren Buffett's had an amazing record because his record is extremely long. But Joe Greenblatt, not as long, but still a very long record, has, I mean, trounced Warren Buffett. Now, and, I mean, I think it's highly unlikely he'll carry on at that level you know, for the length of time that Warren Buffett's um, managed it. But, you know, unbelievably good performance. Um, so, you know, if Joe Greenblatt's bought the stock, then and he's bought it in size. And recently, then, by the sounds of it, as it being important. I'm sorry? And, and also recently, but bought it recently is an important factor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, it doesn't need to have been last week. And obviously, there's a delay. So... This is much more effective in the United States because the 13F filings are done every quarter. So you can see his entire portfolio in the US every quarter and you can see what it, how it changes. So if you're looking at a stock, you know, the chances are that you can see his position as of six weeks ago on average, or if it's quarterly, and you can see how much he's bought or sold in the last quarter. So you and you and if you go back over previous quarters, you can see how much he's uh, how he's built it up. And yeah. and in, interestingly, that the SEC filings are required not just for American investors; they're required for anyone that owns stocks in America. So Terry Smith has to file with the SEC when he buys a U.S. stock. So you can see exactly what Terry Smith has bought or sold. Obviously, sales are more infrequent. I used to have a very uh, famous fund manager who said he never, ever wanted to meet the management of a company because he'd be swayed by the chemistry and all those other kind of emotions. What's your view about investors meeting the management? Well, I, I seem to recall that Terry Smith had said that he didn't think it was a good idea to meet management. But somebody the other day pointed out that he now, um, in his one of his letters recently, said that he does like to meet management. I haven't yet managed to find whether he I, whether he's writ, written down that he didn't like to in the past or whether he didn't um, whether he just told me. Um, but yeah, there's a few people. You know, Nick Courage at Schroeder's Schroeder's Value Team say you know don't waste your time meeting management. James Montier at GMO says exactly the same thing. I don't know who you, you're thinking of, but the, it, wasn't, it wasn't one of those. <laughs> but the, the thing is that. You know, why wouldn't you meet management? Because if you have the opportunity, you know, if you're a professional investor and you've got the opportunity to sit down with the management of the, the companies that you're invested in once a year or twice a year, why wouldn't you? And 
I think you can learn a lot. And Graham Clapp, who used to run one of the big funds of Fidelity, used to run a $20 billion fund um, in London. He has an amazing filing system. So he hand writes on a yellow legal pad. You know, so, you know, one of, one of these jobs, he hand writes his notes from the meeting and they're then filed away. I think he now scans them, but they were filed away in, in binders. And when he next sees the management, he looks back at what they said last time. And he then says, well, hang on a second. You said, when I last saw you 18 months ago, you said you were going to do this and you haven't done it. Why not? And having that conversation is, you know, a very useful way of understanding whether the management are honest and whether they're going to tell you actually what they're going to do. But the other, the other reason is that if they, if they shift from the previous time you met them, if they shift attitude, you know that either something's going wrong or something's going better or that there's a change in their outlook. And, you know, if you've owned a stock for quite a while, those sorts of signals can be very important signals that now should be the time to get out. And the most difficult thing to do for any investor, whether you're a retail investor or a professional investor, is when to sell. Because it's very difficult to sell your winners. It's very difficult to sell your losers. And, you know, every stock, I mean, unless you believe that stock should be held forever, which, you know, I mean, Terry's had a very good successful strategy in, on that basis. Uh, and Nick Train, very long term holder, Warren Buffett, very long term holder. But if you're not quite as clever as these people, which I think I certainly am, and, and most people aren't, there is an optimum period to, to hold something. And you want to know when, when to get out. And you want to be aware that there's a change going on. Having said that, you know, it can also give you the wrong signal. I mean, I remember selling a stock but almost entirely on the basis of um, conversations with the management where I felt that there was something wrong and the management felt there was something wrong, but the stock price carried on going up. It, you know, the, the, the problems that the management anticipated didn't manifest themselves in the share price for much, much until much, much later. So, I got out uh, for the right reasons, but the timing was completely wrong. But, you know, whichever system, whichever way you do it, you always make mistakes. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about the stock market is it's got a great way of, of teaching you humility. And, you know, there's nobody gets everything right. And you just have to have a, have a system. And you know, I, I don't um, criticize people that say, oh, I don't want to meet management because they're only going to tell me some fantastically positive story and it's only going to color my views. I mean, I completely, completely get that. And I don't think I'm immune from that, but I think I feel more comfortable if I've tried to understand what are the changes in their, in their attitude to the long-term outlook for the business. And I feel more comfortable that I've, I've asked the questions and I've got more knowledge out of it. I, I can certainly remember uh, comparing a, uh a meeting with the sales force by the management, the CFO and the CEO of a company. Uh, and um, the uh, afterwards, one of the audience came up to me and said, do you realize they never looked at each other during the whole of that meeting? I, I couldn't see that because I was facing forward. And surprise, surprise, the next day, the, uh, the finance director resigned. And yeah, I've had, I've, 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 no, I've, I've seen that a number of times, although it, it doesn't always mean that there's a problem. I mean, I, I've seen no. that where, you, you know, company coming to the market and you, the management, I mean, clearly can't stand each other. It's but, never a good way to run a business, is it? Uh, let's move on to, um, so do you normally read the accounts backwards or forwards? Um, well, I start at the back, then I jump to the middle, and then I, the, you know, as what I explain in the book is my methodology is to do a first scan of the business in order to ascertain whether it's worth spending more time and digging deeper. And the first scan, I might not even open the accounts. I'll just look at, you know, secondhand financial information that's downloaded from Bloomberg or, 
or analyst reports or whatever. Um, but when I get into the accounts, I mean, I'll start off at the back because there's some sensitive information at the back, things like the commitments um, note. Because if you've got a huge amount of contingency, contingent liabilities, they call it commitments and contingencies note. If you've got a very long contingencies note that's a page or two pages, or in the case of BAT, 20 pages long, then there's clearly going to be a large part of the valuation that hinges on the outcome of these contingencies. And by their nature, those are incredibly difficult to predict. And usually what I'll do is I'll shy away because you know, I could do all the work and still be very wrong because I couldn't ascertain how um, a, a contingency was going to pan out. So that'd be one of the th things that I, that I would look at. But I, you know, I don't start at the, the front of the accounts and work my, work my way to the back. I don't start working at the back, sorry, the back and work my way to the front. And the glossy part, the with all the pictures, I I often actually don't bother reading. I mean, I might, you know, I I will have a look at them, but you know, um, the 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 wonderful pictures and the wonderful story about you know how great a business it is, I kind of switch off a little bit to that. I might, you know, I'll I'll look at it very briefly to un, to make sure I understand what they're trying to pitch, but I don't really absorb it i don't really you know i don't believe it if i put it that way there's a heading in the book understanding the counter argument why would an investor need to understand the counter argument well the the, the this is one of the most important things i mean i i point this out that when i do my initial check i always like to understand this um i'm doing um one of the modules for our Analyst Academy online course at the moment, and I'm doing it actually with 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 a with somebody else helping me, um, and this is on behavioral finance. And confirmation bias is one of the biases that we all suffer from. And one of the one of the funds that I worked at, I remember we owned this stock, and the the PM, one of the PM, said, you know, we should get the Goldman's analyst in. To update us in this stock. And I said, well, you know, the Goldman's analyst is very bullish. We've, he's been in before, we own the stock. What are we possibly going to learn by sitting down in a meeting room for an hour, three or four of us with the Goldman's analyst? We're not going to learn anything. Why don't we get the analyst in from City, who's the bear? And the, 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 my colleague just wouldn't listen to this. He wouldn't have any of it. Why, why would I want, he's an idiot. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And I said, well, you know, he might not, he might be an idiot. We might be really, really smart, but what happens if he's not an idiot? What happens if we're wrong? We've not heard what he's got to say. How stupid can we be to not listen to the counter argument? And it's very interesting. If you um, watch really good investors, they'll get, suddenly interested when somebody comes up with an opposing viewpoint. I see this a lot, um, you know, going around doing my training courses, because the people that are the smartest people are the ones that <laughs> embrace the opposite view. And, you know, often what I'll be going, I'll be doing my forensic accounting course, and I'll flash up a, an example of a stock that they own. And the people that are bad investors will start arguing and will busy tell me why I'm wrong. And they won't really listen to my point of view. I had this with um, a client where they owned Aston Martin and I was explaining to them how Aston Martin couldn't possibly be a successful investment. I mean, it was a you know, simple matter of arithmetic, but they weren't really interested in listening to me. In contrast, um, you know, I was in a, at an, one of my big clients, an institution in Scotland, and one of the one of the stocks that I flag up in 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 the course is one of their big holdings. And man, they started asking me, "Well, why do you think this?" and 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 tell us a bit more. And um, and in fact, could you you know when you're coming back next time, could you build this out into a bigger case study because I think it's quite interesting. 
So they were, you know, they owned lots of this company. And what they wanted was somebody to come in and challenge them and say, well, I think, I think all these things could go wrong. And you're far, be you're far better off doing that because A, you will reinforce your own conviction and understand better if you're right. And B, if it then starts to raise doubts in your mind, you'll then be able to spend more time. And that same client, um, one of the stocks that I pointed out, they emailed me three weeks later and they said, oh, thanks very much for pointing that out because we've now gone back and looked at the accounts and you're dead right, the, the accounts are crooked. And, you know, I mean, I'd been saying that, you know, I, I wasn't a genius on, on this in, by any means. I'd looked at this company and thought it was uninvestable because the accounts were crooked. It then proceeded to treble. Right? So it's a very good story and, and it's still, you know, up very significantly, but the numbers are nonsense. I uh, uh, used to go, uh... Uh, on roadshows around institutions with analysts and you know you and I did it quite a lot in the past and there's one fantastic analyst who always went on the road with two sets of presentations about every company the bull and the bear case and he'd say so which way are you and he'd do exactly the opposite case as a challenge and he, you know because in his mind you could say look if I'm going to be a seller of it you know obviously new information comes up that, that nobody could have predicted but he would say look if I'm going to be a seller of it when it gets you know to this uh, exalted price it's going to be for the following reasons if i'm going to be a buyer it'll be for this set of reasons so so he was always saying look you know the share price is a consensus between opposing opinions and you can't really understand it unless you can understand the counter argument so i, I totally agree with you steve uh, absolutely and i you know, as you know i always just have that you know the powerpoint the two column powerpoint the bull points and the bear points because every stock has got you know some opportunities and some risks and you know if you don't if you own something you don't understand the risks you're you, it's a recipe for disaster now there's another section in the book called uh, intriguingly moat advantages so so what are moat advantages well the, the you know warren buffett obviously came up with the term economic moats and you know i go through the the conventional definitions of of what moats are and discuss, you know, what I think are the more potent, um, potent ones. I don't think, you know, the, the term economic moat, I mean, that doesn't, you know, it's very, very visual and very, very effective communication tool. But I think people get this a little bit wrong sometimes. So some people think an economy of scale is a moat and, you know, an economy of scale can be a moat if you're Amazon or if you're Walmart, because it's almost impossible for anybody to, to get that scale. But most economies of scale aren't impregnable and aren't a moat. They're an advantage, but they're not an advantage that somebody else can't break down. And what I do in the book is I try and also, you know, show some, some different categories of moats, some new moats, you know, things like um, moats for digital companies. And um, obviously, one of the primary um, objectives of, of retail investors is to acquire a portfolio of quality businesses. And so understanding quality is a primary um, objective of any research. So thinking about moats is very important. And, um, you know, I think, you know, the most important moat is pricing power. I mean, if you read any of the literature, I don't think it's actually coined in, in that way, but pricing power is the key determinant of a business's quality. Okay. So finally, are there any resources that the hedge fund manager has access to that the retail investor doesn't? Or are there some things that the retail investor doesn't really know very much about that would be available to him if, if he knew where to go? Well, I mean, uh, importantly, um, you've got access to research when you're a hedge fund manager. And although the quality of research is very variable, um, the research collectively makes up the consensus estimates, which tends to be a primary determinant of the valuation of a business. And 
therefore, if you can then examine what makes up the consensus estimate, and you can, you know, at a big hedge fund, you can just phone up the analyst and say, send me your model. And you can then go and look through all the top analysts and what, what are they assuming for this business? And are those assumptions sensible? So you look at it in a much more granular way. But there, there's a, you know, I've just been in a call with a, a, a chap who runs a fund on the other side of the pond. And we were talking about um, data scraping and using data science. Lots of hedge funds now have got data scientists. So they're, they're interpreting day-to-day -day data that you know, the private investor doesn't possibly have access to. There's a huge range of information that you've access to. But of course, having more information might make you believe that you're, you, you know more, but often it, it, often it doesn't help. I mean, the best ideas always, always, always are the simplest ideas. You don't need a huge amount of information to make money in the stock market. You need a good idea. You need a good understanding of uh, a stock where the handicappers have got the, the odds wrong and where the, mar you know, the market has underestimated the, the company's earnings potential. And if you can find that, and you can find that in a simple way, that is the surest way to make money. And you don't need all that information. But in the book, we do refer to a few sources that the private investor can access. There, there, are, there are lots of really good sources of information. You just need to know where to go. Steve, thank you for taking the time to uh, talk to us about the book. Before, uh, before we finish off, how can uh, uh, readers or investors get hold of your book? Well, they can get hold of me on Twitter at Steve Clapham. They can get hold of me on my website behind the balance sheet.com on the the website there's a the new book and there's a page dedicated to the smart money method how to make i keep i have forgotten the title how to pick stocks like a hedge fund pro and um we've got you know a bunch of reviews on there and uh, you know it's available on amazon it's available the the publisher is harriman house it's available on their website for people overseas. Um, that it's not always available on Amazon for reasons I don't understand. If you're in Sweden, you can't buy it on Amazon. I, I, I have no idea why. But um, I hope people read it. I hope they enjoy it. I had um, Phil Oakley, the I think he's a deputy editor. He's certainly a columnist at the Investors Chronicle. Um, may, tweeted about it last Sunday. Very nice, very complimentary tweet saying he thought it was one of the best investment books, one of the best how-to investment books he'd read. And I think, you know, I, I imagine he's read a few. He's written a book himself, so he knows how difficult it was. So it's not just me. Lots of people seem to be enjoying it, which is great. You know, it's fantastic. Steve, I've read it, and I've certainly enjoyed it. It's great fun, very readable. Thanks again for uh, joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody soon on the next edition of Harvard Talks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.